Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for your goodness, for your kindness, for your mercy, for the blood of your Son who cleanses us from all sin. We thank you, Lord God, for your patience and your undeserved graciousness to us. Lord God, draw us all closer to you, both personally and corporately. We know that we are unworthy of the calling you've placed upon us. Nonetheless, it is your calling, and we are here. In the name of Jesus, be with us now. Amen. Something I think about quite a lot. We're looking again at 2 Timothy, written at a time launching the main era of early Christian history that prefigures the return of Christ, the time from 66 to 70 AD. Okay? Chapter 1, verse 9. God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. As most of us know, Jesus Christ is him on earth. Christ Jesus is him in eternity. Notice also the distinction between our salvation and our calling. The distinction between our salvation and our calling. We were not just born again by God's mercy and grace to go to heaven. We were born again to fulfill a calling in this life and in this world. We were born and born again to fulfill a calling in this life and in this world, which the Lord will ask us to give account of when we meet him. That is the reality. Now notice we're not talking about salvation, we're talking about calling. We're saved by the blood of Jesus, but our reward is according to our faithfulness to his calling, whatever that may be. You can have a missionary in the, the third world, and it's his calling, and you can have a, a, a nice lady who washes the church steps, you know, and prays for the pastor. That's her calling. It's not the calling itself. It's the faithfulness to the calling. Don't look at people, don't put people on a pedestal, including the, this ugly face you're looking at. It's the faithfulness to the calling, not what the calling is. Now, let's look at this further. Who saved us and called us with a holy calling. Remember, Timothy is talking about the last days. Paul is taking what's happening to him on the Nero in 66 and saying this is what the last days are going to be like as we looked at last night. Some of you, I suppose many of you may have heard me say the following. If I was going to raise up someone to prepare the way for the return of Christ, to place here at this time in history, when prophecy is being fulfilled so much quicker and quicker in the church, in the Middle East, etc. If I was going to get somebody to prepare the way for my son's return, if I was God, and I was going to get somebody to prepare for the return of Jesus, I could come up with a candidate a lot better than that screwball I saw in the mirror this morning when I was cleaning my teeth, when I was shaving. Why me, why now? Why did God place me here now? I mean, I know the scripture says Elijah was a man like us, and I'm certainly no Elijah. At the same time, I was born at this time by God's providence, and I was born again at this time by God's providence to do the stuff I'm doing but I don't think I'm up to the task. And that's what it says, not according to our works. <laughs> it's something he has to do through us. But I don't see myself as being the most worthy candidate. Please don't take it personally. <laughs> when I 
looked at you lot. <laughs> I don't reckon you measure up to it either. Nonetheless, here we are. His ways are not our ways. We can all come up with a more noble contingent of the faithful remnant. But he's caused us to be born now. We could have been born 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. He's caused us to be born now. And he's caused us to be born again now. This is an incredible thing in itself. You think of people like, why doesn't he get John Wycliffe or William Tyndale or something like that? Why is he getting people like us? I don't know, maybe they were, were people like us. <laughs> There's a monument to an American military hero from the Second World War next to a subway station in Queens, New York. His name was Admiral Halsey, and he was commander of American Navy in the Pacific. And on this small monument to him, I guess he might have lived in that neighborhood or something, it says, heroes are not unusual men. They are ordinary men in unusual circumstances. <laughs> I think he had a point. I think he had a point. It's the circumstances in which the Lord has placed us that are exceptional. We're just ordinary people here under exceptional circumstances. But we're not exceptional. It is imperative we recognize those two things. One, in his providence and wisdom, God has placed us, you and I both, here at this exceptional time in history under exceptional circumstances. But there's nothing exceptional about us or we ourselves. That's quite a thing, isn't it? That is almost preliminary before we consider the other things that Paul was writing about. We've got to understand that. We're saved to fulfill a calling. We are in unusual circumstances, but we are not unusual people. We left off in chapter 2. A couple of issues from chapter 2, we stopped in verse 18. But let's look down now. Paul then gives personal pastoral advice as a senior pastor to a junior one. Another aspect of the purpose and theme of First and Second Timothy is Paul as a senior pastor and as an apostle giving instruction, imparting his wisdom and his experience, or the wisdom of his experience, to the next generation of leader. Okay? He's passing on the baton, as it were, to the next generation, to people like Timothy and Titus. That's what he's doing. Now he says this, to flee from youthful lusts, things of that nature. A man cleanses himself from things which will be, make him a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Marco spoke about this. The things that are wrong in our lives personally are obstacles to fulfilling our calling. If I was a better believer, in many respects, the Lord would use me more than he does. If you were a better believer, in many respects, the Lord would be using you more than he does. That is the reality for all of us, and I am not an exception. But let's go down. Verses 23 and 24. Refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. And the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, 
but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. How do we reconcile this apostolic instruction with Paul's public castigation of an index, a list of nefarious figures in the church. What he says about Damas in chapter 4, or what he says about Alexander the coppersmith and Hymenaeus, or what he says about any of those people, religious and homogeneous, etc. How do we reconcile this saying, don't be quarrelsome, Lord's servant shouldn't be quarrelsome, be kind to all, patient even when wrong. How do we reconcile what he writes and what he teaches? There are some Christians, even well-intentioned ones, who will say, oh, the Lord's servants are not called to be quarrelsome. And that becomes something that means that they won't stand up and confront error. Understand what he's saying here. He is drawing a distinction between the leaders who teach and promote error and the people who get sucked in to believing it. For those who get sucked in, he says, be patient able to teach even when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. People caught up in wrong doctrine require a correction of that doctrine. And they need to realize it was wrong. They need to repent of it. But you treat sheep one way, you treat wolves another. John chapter 10. You treat sheep one way. You treat wolves another. The way you treat the sheep when they're in error is entirely different than the way you treat the wolves who devour the sheep. And we know the wolves often come perhaps most often come in sheep's clothing. You understand what he's saying here? We have to draw a distinction between sincere people. I know and you know Christians. They've never been taught the word of God exegetically. They've always been in these weird churches with experiential theology and wrong doctrine where well, emotionalism is confused with spirituality. I've seen them. I've seen videos of people in St. Andrew's Charlie Wooden places like this in Holy Trinity Bedlam, and they run around. <laughs> I had a picture, the Lord gave me a vision. That's the emphasis. The emphasis is never exposition of scripture. The word of God to them becomes something somebody dreams up. Now, this is not to deny there could be a prophecy or something like that, but the prophecy must be in accordance with the doctrines of Scripture and tested accordingly. We get our doctrine and our praxis and our instruction from Scripture. Prophecy has its place, but its place is never to replace Scripture. Those who teach people these things are wolves. People in these churches need to repent of it. But the way you deal with Alexander and Hymenaeus is not the way you deal with the people who they have misled. With Macrothumia, great patience and instruction. Perhaps the Lord may grant them instruction. Notice the Lord's servant must be able to teach. Not every preacher has been to seminary, 
Not every preacher can read Greek and Hebrew. Not every preacher is scholarly. Not every preacher is educated in academic theology. But every preacher must be able to rightly divide the word of God. We have three words primarily for the different kinds of preaching in scripture. My apologies to those who've heard this. Charigma, charismatic preaching. Charigma is evangelistic preaching. It is preaching the gospel. Okay? Not every Christian has the gift of evangelism. But every Christian is a witness. We cannot all fish with a net but we can all fish with a pole or a rod. Nobody should not be able to share their faith, witness one-on-one, -on -one, give somebody a track, give their testimony. We can all fish with a rod. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord. Someone who could stand up publicly and preach the gospel to a larger crowd and see people respond to it, they have the gift of evangelism. They can fish with a net. Others fish with a rod, but we all fish. Kerygma. Now with those who are charismatic, there is often a big problem. They forget, in their zeal for souls, they forget that Jesus never said to make converts, but make disciples. They will lead people to Christ and forget about the rest. They'll forget about the church they're putting them in. They'll forget about the right doctrine. They'll forget about getting them grounded. Okay. They just count souls saved, things like that. Their zeal for the gospel may be right, but they will compromise on other things. It may begin innocently, but it is wrong. One example with this would be somebody like Greg Laurie. Another was Barry Smith, a friend of mine. I'm not condemning these people. I'm just saying what they did was not scriptural. Jesus never said to make converts. He said to make disciples. Just get them saved, hallelujah. Read the parable of the sower and the seed. Three or four, <laughs> the birds ate them, the demons attacked them. Second, homilia, where we get the word homily. Homilia is exhortation, encouraging. Maybe even correcting. Homily, homilia is pastoral preaching. It must be doctrinally correct, but it is not expositional theology. Okay? It may have elements of exposition in it, but it still rightly divides the word of God and applies it pastorally. Every pastor must be able to deliver a homily. He may or may not be able to deliver a charisma, but he must be able to deliver a homily or he shouldn't be a pastor. Third, The Daskin, 
related to the word didactic. This is people like yours truly, people who can expound doctrine. But in each case, the word of God must be rightly divided. Today, false gospels are prevalent. Remember, grace is free, but it is not cheap. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Just accept Jesus into your heart and put your hand up. In biblical charisma, there's a call to repentance. Or as our brother Ray Comfort puts it, don't preach grace until you preach law. David Paulson was correct. The early Christians spoke about the love of God among themselves, but that's not what they preached to the unsaved. <laughs> the unsaved cannot understand the love of God until they get saved. <laughs> okay. Then there is didaskin. Not everybody has the gift of teaching. Some do, some do not. However, each will give account to the Lord. What gospel did you preach? Did you aim to make disciples or only converts? I had a friend who I liked, and we were rather close, and he helped me a lot practically at one point in the ministry and he was speaking in some wacky churches, doing evangelistic crusades. And I said to him, you're not making disciples, you're making converts. You're putting people in these wacky churches. Remember what Jesus said. The Pharisees went to the ends of the earth to make one proselyte and they became twice as much a son of hell as they used to be. Among the churches he would speak in was the word faith church. It's churches. And his response was, God has only called me to preach the gospel and to prepare the church for the last days. And I said, when you preach the gospel, it's supposed to be about making disciples, not converts. And concerning the last days, the Lord warns of wars one time, rumors of wars one time, famines one time, earthquakes one time, pestilence one time, one time, one time, Israel one time, one time, one time, one time. Deception in the church, false teachers and false prophets four times. Jesus warned about deception aimed at the elect four times more than he did anything else as a sign. He couldn't answer. His platform, his ministry, became a kind of an idol. This is a dangerous thing. When the work of the Lord becomes more important than the Lord of the work, and you can justify it, people are being saved, saved into what? A zoo? Well, his daughter, I knew, lovely young lady, personal tragedy in her life and a serious medical condition that was dormant in her liver but resurfaced in adult life. And following a personal tragedy, she went into serious clinical depression. And she was going to a church, just believe God for the healing. Name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. And if you don't get the healing, you don't have any faith. <clears throat> Let's look at the same epistle. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 20. Erastus remained at Corinth, but Trophimus I left sick at Miletus. 
Why did Paul leave someone ill? Why didn't he lay hands on him and command the malady to disappear in the name of Jesus? Didn't Paul have the gift of healing? Wasn't he an apostle? Didn't he have faith? Didn't Trophimus have any faith? Yeah. And there are people who have a thorn from Satan that for his own purpose the Lord decides not to remove. Even if you don't get healed, you will ultimately be healed in the resurrection or the rapture. Everybody ultimately gets healed as a believer. If you get healed in the meantime, it's temporary. Unless the rapture or resurrection, unless the Lord comes, the bioentropy is going to take over and you're going to check out anyway. There is no such thing as complete temporal healing. Healing is in the atonement, but it's not fully realized until the rapture or the resurrection. Then you will never get sick again. Then you'll be immune from everything. We'll be immune from everything. But in the meantime, I hope the Lord heals my lymphatic edema. I'm tired of being plump and hopping around on crutch, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of being predisposed to cellulitis. I'm tired of it. I hope he heals me. But even if he does, unless Jesus returns, something else is gonna to get to me. <laughs> Don't you believe in healing, brother? Don't you believe by his stripes we are healed? Yes, but the healing is permanent. When it happens, there's going to be a permanent healing. So this pastor, his daughter, this preacher, his daughter went to this church and they put her under this stuff, claimed the healing, and if you don't get healed, it's because you don't have any faith. She hangs herself. I didn't have the heart to say it to his face, but he knew what I thought. And I did say it to his son, who was a friend of mine. Now you see why I was telling you not to put people in those churches? Now do you understand why I was so against you putting people in those churches, leading people to Christ, and put them into churches that teach that garbage? It's claimed the life of his own daughter. True story. Take no pleasure in repeating it. Loved the guy. Loved his daughter. She was a nice person. <coughs> That's the reality. Everyone understand? Now her, her, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. I could be gentle with her, or someone like her. But those villains who were teaching you this stuff? And they do it usually with a financial motive? And not infrequently driven by spiritual pride? This is a problem. There's a difference between those who victimize and those who are victims. The victims may believe the nonsense themselves. We need to show patience to such people. Correct with gentleness if we can. Remember, Jesus never once compromised truth in the name of love. Remember the Syrophoenician woman whose little girl was demon-possessed? I can't give children's bread to dogs. He told her her beliefs were unfit for human consumption. He told the woman at the well. He told the woman caught in adultery. Now look how kind he was to all of them. Look how kind he was. But he never compromised the truth. Those who will compromise the truth in the name of love do not have the love of Jesus. 
they have emotionally charged religious idiocy masquerading as love, but it's not the love of Jesus. Philippians 1, 9. This I pray, that your love may abound, you know, more and more in all knowledge and real discernment. Without a doctrinal knowledge of Scripture and without discernment, you are not going to have the authentic love of Jesus. You're going to have a stupid, potentially destructive counterfeit. You want the real thing? Or do you want a piece of garbage? But you can't have both. I think most Christians would say they want the real thing. But then why are they subscribing to garbage? <laughs> Now, this stuff increases in the last days. He says that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. These things are traps of the devil that they get into. These false beliefs are traps of the devil that Jesus wants to get them out of. And so he tells us, correct these people, get them out of that trap. They're in the worst kind of trap. They don't know they're trapped. It's like a fish in a tank. That's their world. They don't know that there's such things as lakes, seas, and oceans. They think that's it. But then he puts it into the last day's context, which we've already looked at. And he says, the Lord has delivered me out of all these things in verse 11, but in verse 12, now look at that. I endured out of all of them the things that are going to happen to the Christians in the last days are the things that happened to Paul. You see that? Same as Matthew 10. He goes, all this stuff they're going to do, they do, they reject as regards to the faith, they'll make further progress and all this stuff. And he says, I endured these things, but the Lord delivered me. These things are going to happen to us, but Jesus will deliver us. But we ought not be deceived into thinking they are not going to happen to us. He tells us in the next verse 12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All. All. Sex education in schools. What they're teaching children about abnormality. Perversion is normal. Try to be a Christian parent who stands up to it. You're a homophobe. We're going to report you to social services. A lesbian social worker will file a petition with the court to have your children taken from you. Don't think they won't do this. They're almost on the door of doing it. I've been warning for years they're going to go after homeschoolers. They're already trying in Wales. Remember, the school system is not about educating. It's failing in its mandate to educate. It is there for purposes of social and political engineering. The teachers' unions do not represent good teachers, only bad ones. In the United States, the teachers' unions are a political campaign fund for the Democratic Party. That's all they are. They protect bad teachers with tenure, not good ones. It's about social engineering. It's not about educating kids. Every year the math scores, science scores go down. Kids know less and less about things like history in the state schools. Not everybody is able to afford to send their children to private schools. Now you can homeschool your kids and make sure they learn what they're supposed to. 
But now they want to come in and supervise that. Not for academic performance, but for what you're teaching them. All. All. I've been warning, it's getting harder for Christians in the police, harder for Christians in the teaching profession, harder for Christians in the medical profession. I think of my friend Michael Harry. He was the chief of obstetrics at the Christian Hospital in Galilee for years. Saved the lives of countless mothers and countless babies. He was from Manchester, England. When he came back from the mission field, he could not get a job. Highly experienced obstetrician could not get a job. Why? Because he would not perform non-therapeutic abortions. I went into the medical profession to save the lives of babies and of mothers, not to kill people, not to kill little babies. He retired six years early because he couldn't get a job. That was then. It's worse, worse now. I know my friend Emma. She's an anesthetist, a physician. She will not scrub for a non-therapeutic abortion. You wouldn't believe the trouble they put her through. You're criticizing your colleagues. and Unbelievable! That these are good Christians and good physicians. Christians in the police, Christians in the prosecutions, the Crown Prosecutor's Office, or the District Attorney's Office. It's getting harder and harder and harder. All, all who desire to live for Christ Jesus. Christian bakers in America being sued and fined for not making a cake for a same-sex wedding. A Christian couple in England with a bed and breakfast would not accommodate two homosexual men in the same bed being sued and fined and being forced to be. Judges. Judges in court decisions calling the scriptures hate speech. Then we're told in verse 13 of chapter 3, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You saw that woman, Vicar, whatever she was, the religious freak in Toronto. Is she deceiving others? Yes. But she's deceived herself. The people who get caught up in this stuff, yes, they are deceivers, but they are deceived themselves. This is particularly true in regard to homosexuality and lesbianism. In Romans 1, it says three times, the Lord gives them over to it. They think it's natural and normal. They have what John's epistle describes as a spirit of error. God gives them over to it. They're going to go from bad to worse. They're not going to get better. And the reason they're so willing to deceive others is because they are deceived themselves. They actually believe in the moral and ethical validity of what they're doing, and they think the ends justifies the means. If you ever want to read a book, read the book by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, The Gulag Archipelago. I read that book when I was younger, when he got the Nobel Prize, Russian. People who say they're socialists, Oh, they're for the poor, for they're for the working classes. And they're going to fight, you know, for the, for the proletariat, and they're going to oppose the rich. What they did to the poor and working classes was unspeakable. Oh, 
and they're going to save the environment. The Avril Sea disappeared in Russia. They raked the environment in Eastern Europe. In those countries, the communist countries, what they did to the environment was far worse than anything in the West. It's ridiculous. It is utterly ridiculous. They are deceived. And they deceive others. They think the ends justifies the means. They actually believe that stuff. They believe Christianity is hate speech. They believe homosexuality is normal. They believe ab aborting a fetus with no medical impetus to do it, no clinical reason, they don't see it as wrong. Now what does Paul say? How does he tell them to react? You, however, continue in the things you've learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them, and that from childhood his mother was a believer, you have known the sacred writings, the scriptures, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. What do you do when this stuff happens? Hold on to the truths of Scripture. It's God's word. He does not lie and it will not fail. Paul points him to the word, to right doctrine, to not playing games with words, to avoid religious babbling, and to orthopamantes. And he goes on. It'll give you wisdom and leads to salvation. Now this is not talking about salvation in terms of being born again. It's salvation in terms of he who perseveres to the end shall be saved. It's talking about salvation future, redemption. Not salvation past, which is justification. Not salvation present, which is sanctification, but salvation future, which is redemption. If you hold on to the scriptures, you're going to be saved through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God. Oh, Lord. At this point, most of the New Testament was not yet written. And what existed was not yet collated into any kind of a codex or unit. It mainly meant the Old Testament, all scripture. We've warned many times, look out for people and churches who think we are New Testament Christians. The Old Testament was fulfilled by Christ. We don't need it now. No, no, no. Hebrews chapter 5 tells us the Old Testament is mostly meat. The New Testament is mostly milk. What happens if you only give a baby milk and never weed it onto solid food? Hebrews tells us. Yet again, we have the churches, as I described them. The epics of the Old Testament are bedtime stories or Sunday school lessons for little kids. Jonah and the whale and David and Goliath. Don't get me wrong, I have no problem with Jonah and the whale and David and Goliath as Sunday school lessons for little kids, but that's what the Old Testament is to them. 
They may read the Psalms ritually or liturgically, but that's it. They don't study the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. They have no idea that their diet consists only of milk, not of meat. In fact, because they have been mistaught, they think the following. These things are fulfilled in Christ. We have a better covenant now. That's true. Therefore, we don't need the Hebrew Scriptures anymore because they're fulfilled in Christ. We're New Testament Christians. We've pressed on to maturity, not knowing that they've reverted to infant formula. They misunderstand what the Scriptures say about the Old Testament. It is our tutor, our tutor, pointing us to Christ. Most of you Christians would know that you can have the Lord's Supper in your church. But if somebody came and demonstrated the Passover and showed how Jesus fulfilled the Paschal ritual at the Last Supper, you'd understand the doctrine of the gospel a lot better, wouldn't you? <laughs> Unless you understand the, gospel, the, 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 the Passover, you can't understand the Lord's Supper beyond a limited point. Unless you understand the law, you can't understand the gospel beyond a limited point. It's the converse that's true. Teach the children the milk. To really learn the scripture, you must learn how to interpret the Old Testament in light of the new. All scripture. In the last days, there is going to be a gravitation away from the Old Testament. This is a natural bedfellow and a first cousin to replacement theology, so-called Christian anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. We don't want the Hebrew scriptures. That's why you see these people like Alex Awad and, and, and Sizer, you know, they shy away from any prophecies or promises to Israel in the Old Testament. We just believe what the New Testament says about things like love. That's, you know, what is this? Oh, my Lord. Of course, the New Testament also speaks about the restoration of Israel, but they gloss over that. Well, then he says the following. Preach the word in chapter 4. In season, out of season. Now look at verse 3. For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves. Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, Rick Godwin, Joyce Meyer, Bill Johnson. That's what they're going to do. Mike Bickle, Beth Moore. That crazy or that, that Heidi Baker? They're going to go out and get people like this because they're going to tickle their ears. Tell them what they want to hear. <laughs> it's not that they have never heard true doctrine. It's that they don't want to hear it. They will not endure it. They will not put up with a comprehensive understanding of God's truth. They will not tolerate it. Remember, Psalm 119, the sum of thy word is truth. Everything in Scripture is true. Everything in Scripture is true. Both Testaments, it's all true. But it is the sum of it that is truth. Well, not only that, they 
will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths. Even the ones who knew the truth will abandon it in favor of myths. Doctrines that people invented, stupid stories, empty cliches. People who once knew the truth will turn to myths. This year, 2018, the largest evangelical denomination in the developed world, the Southern Baptists of the United States, at their annual conference, the president of the Southern Baptists, J.D. Greer, said, preached in his keynote address to the Baptist Convention in the United States, this is the president of the Southern Baptist now, that saved Christians should become the number one advocates for homosexual and lesbian rights. What rights are they denied? They have the right to come into a school, change the curriculum, and teach your children and grandchildren. It's normal. They have the right to adopt and bring children up in those kinds of family settings. They have the right to sue Christian bakers for not making a wedding cake. Now they fired a Christian physician because he would only address patients based on what they were genetically. What rights are they denied? This was a Southern Baptist. This man knew the truth. He was the president of the Baptist Convention. He knew the truth but he turned away from it. When you turn away from the truth, you have turned away from Christ. He is the truth. He's the way, truth, life. You have turned away from the truth. You have turned away from Jesus Christ. Now let's go back a little bit. In chapter 2, verse 23, ignorant speculations. Something we have warned about before, and I only mention it now briefly in passing. We have a separate teaching dealing with it. In Isaiah 9, Jesus comes. It speaks about both his first and second coming. But look what precedes his coming in chapter 8. Verse 19, they say to you, consult the mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter. Arise in the occult. But make no mistake, a lot of what's called prophecy and things like this a lot of things happening in some of these churches are occult. Holy Ghost miracle cloths to take away debt sold by Morris Cirillo to unemployed people for 25 pounds. This is known as muti in Africa. Witch doctors do it. This is the occult. The visualization, the labyrinths. The emergent church, this is the occult. But look what else he says. Verse 12, you're not to say it's a conspiracy in regard to all those people call a conspiracy. Conspiracy theories were around at the time of the first coming of Jesus. Conspiracy theories abound with the second coming of Jesus. There are purely secular conspiracy theorists. They've got theories about the JFK assassination. That's one of the biggest. There's no end to it. There are people who have actually developed 
clinical psychosis by obsession with conspiracies. Verified by psychiatric medicine, they have become psychotic. And some of them have become delusional and paranoid. If you don't agree with their <laughs> conspiracy theories, you must be part of the conspiracy. <laughs> This has gotten into the church. It is simply conspiracy theory, but there are lunatic French Christians calling it discernment and prophecy. And they're more concerned with these things than they are with what the scripture says. I get a lot of email and a lot of posts and things. As soon as I see Illuminati, delete. Yeah, I know about that stuff. I know what people say. I have an open mind. But these people are obsessed with it. That's not where the scripture puts the emphasis. Delete. They speculate. It leads to trouble. Well, let's look at verse 5 of chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. But you be sober in all things. We saw what happened when Elam, Assemblies of God, Holy Trinity, Brompton, and everything, they were telling people to be drunk. In all things. Oh, they were only drunk in the spirit. They weren't drunk on alcohol. All things includes everything. <laughs> Be sober. On the day of Pentecost, they heard the mighty deeds of God, not drunken hysterics. We know about this. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Then he talks about himself and what's happening to him. He says, I fought the good fight. I finished the course, I've kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. We are supposed to want him to come. What else is going to stop this wickedness? This non therapeutic abortion, this teaching little children at the age of five that homosexuality is normal. What is going to stop this? The return of Jesus will stop it. We can oppose it and we'll be persecuted for opposing it, but he's going to stop it. That's for sure. He's going to stop it. We have to love his appearing. Live our lives accordingly. He's going to reward those who are faithful. The goal of every one of us should be 2 Timothy 4.8. The goal, the life's goal of every one of us, you, me, the goal of every one of us is to be able to say with the same confidence, in the future is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me. That should be our goal. That should be the bottom line. That should be the purpose of our life in this world. Well done, good and faithful servant. Paul went through a really tough time. And he was telling the church that he was leaving before Nero killed him, go back to the scriptures. 
Hold on to what you have. Strengthen what remains. It was a bad time. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And then that list of emperors came. One worse than the other. And it goes on. It goes on. Now elsewhere, Paul says, in these things we are more than conquerors. <laughs> Think of Jesus. He wound up crucified, but in his resurrection he was the conqueror. Paul knew that. He told Timothy, go back to the scriptures. Hold on to it. Rightly divide the word of God. They're not going to endure truth. They won't put up with sound doctrine. They will not endure truth. And he tells them something else. He tells them, you're going to have people in the character of Jonas and Jambres with pretended signs and wonders. In verse 8, men of depraved mind, doing miracles apparently, but they're depraved. Pharaoh's magicians did supernatural acts by the power of Satan, didn't they? The Antichrist and false prophet are going to do supernatural acts by the power of Satan. But wanting to have their ears tickled, there's going to be people claiming to be Christians, saved Christians, who are going to swallow that stuff. As if that's the proof of the pudding. Lord, did we not do miracles in your name? Yeah, you did. Now get out of here. That's not the proof of the pudding. Is it to deny miracles and the supernatural? Of course not. I am not a cessationist. I do not agree with people like John MacArthur. But I know there's a counterfeit. They won't endorse sound doctrine. They'll get doctrines that tickle their ears. They'll get teachers in accordance with their own desires. They will follow the show. Whoever puts on the best show, that's where they'll go to church. That's what they'll gravitate towards. That's what's going to happen. Those who don't go with this are going to be persecuted. That's what's going to happen. Not just by the world, by people claiming to be Christians. Alexander and Hymenaeus and Demas. That's what's going to happen. That's exactly what's going to happen. What happened to me is what's going to happen to you. But love is appearing. Like what we always say, when you see these things happening, lift up your head, your redemption draws near. The bad news is obvious. The good news should be even more obvious. We've talked about this many times. It's like birth pangs. When the baby is born, you're happy, et cetera, et cetera. No, things were going downhill quick. These false teachers and false prophets were all over the place. They were waiting for Peter and Paul to die so they could take over the church. They were waiting for the apostles to be killed so they could take over the church. They hovered like vultures. They're hovering like vultures now. They're looking to take over. What can we do about it? Strengthen the things that remain. How do you do that? Go back to the word. Rightly 
divided. Hold on to it. Don't worry, he is coming. We need to strengthen the things that remain. See you in the morning. Tomorrow we'll have the Lord's Supper and a Q&A. If you have questions about anything at this conference from last night or through today, please write them down. We'll have a question and answer time tomorrow. Have a very good night. God bless.